Καλησπέρα σας. Καλησπέρα. Hello. Okay. Hi everyone. Uh, it's, a great blessing. it's a great blessing to be with all of you tonight. Tonight we're going to uh, go a little off our uh, trodden path of uh, the scriptures in which we were practicing and we're going to do a little bit more of uh, talking about the Triodion and the um, and the Great Lenten period. Uh, so the Triodion and Great Lent period, the, the, pr the premise for tonight's discussion is that every time we get into this uh, great Lenten period, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, not some anticipation, some anxiety, and some thought process about how do we become spiritually edified uh, during great Lent. I guess what I, my hope is from tonight's discussion is how do we take the themes from the Triodion, which is the preparatory period before uh, great Lent, and then how do we then translate that to our effort with um, um, understanding what we need to do with our day-to-day -day lives as Orthodox Christians. Because we all know the themes and we're gonna go over them kind of in quick uh, succession uh, during the Triodion and Great Lent. But sadly, I guess the question is, why don't we relate them to present day and connect them with our day-to-day -day lives? And that's where I wanna kind of have some discussion points about the Sunday uh, about the Sundays during uh, the Triodion that also encompass uh, great and holy Lent. Now, we all know this past Sunday, the prodigal son. Uh, I'm going to go to the, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to move forward to the Sunday of the last judgment. Okay. Now the Sunday of the last judgment, which we're going to talk about now is for Midfair Sunday that's coming up. And we're going to discuss in earnest what it's about and what does it lead us into? Because for me, this is my favorite Sunday of all of great three of you. So remember, the Triodion is the three ode period that encompasses the preparatory weeks of before Great Lent. It actually encompasses Great Lent, and it actually includes, well, that's not true. It finishes with Palm Sunday. And then in some sequential order, some Triodion books include Holy Week. And then they end, can you guys guess with what service they end the culmination of that period? What service? Which day? Or, huh? Uh, before. Because Pascha is Pascha. Pascha leads into the Pentecostari and the Easter, right? The Pentecostari is the fifth. Uh, well, so close. So usually what happens is with the, with the, um, with the, with the Triodion, if it's broken up into two ways, it either ends with Palm Sunday, mm -hmm. liturgy, because that night service is called the bridegroom service, the Nymphio service, which is for that beginning of the stable, uh, the standardization of Holy Week, or Holy Saturday morning. Right. Holy Saturday morning is that last service before the resurrection. Even though they call it the Proti Anastasis, uh, I always found that very, um, very perplexing uh, why they uh, always call it the first Anastasis. But when we talk about that, and I'll discuss a little bit when we go into Holy Week, but when they call the first, they call the Saturday morning the first resurrection, it's because when we look, well, here. Let's, let's put everyone to a test. I actually jumped. I actually jumped ship. Um, I, don't, I can't get on my Facebook. Oh, boy. Um, can I? No, let's go to Saturday of Souls. So, uh, let's see what this one says. Uh, this is a kind of a minor one, but okay. So, this upcoming Saturday, this upcoming Saturday is defined as the first Saturday of Souls. Can anyone tell me and my friends online, which were all which were all wise theologians, right? Even myself, um, how many defined Saturday of Souls exist? Defined correctly, correctly exist in the Orthodox calendar. Uh, 
Irini, you say four? Yes. Okay. Who, who has another number? I saw two spectrum. Right. <laughs> but I'll, wait. Someone two. say another number? Two. Uh, the correct answer is two. And I'm going to tell you why. Um, the issue is, the issue was that every Saturday is actually a commemoration of those who fall asleep. Okay. And that's why all memorial services were prescribed for Saturday. And that's why they would traditionally go to the cemeteries on Saturdays to fix the graves, to light their seven day candles and to offer the koliva for those who were posed. Okay. And the Orthodox church actually only celebrates two defined Saturday of souls. Then, and our wonderful friend, uh, James, Jim Andreo also pointed out that we even put on our calendar that there's three. Because then that defends Irini's statement and then goes to the thing. So now we're playing the game of um, truth, my head shaking, and truth. <laughs> so truthfully, there's only two Saturday souls. Truthfully, we actually think there's four Saturday of souls. So the three that we celebrate now during Great Lent were put into place by early church priests and fathers here in the United States to commemorate the general participation of Saturdays and the memorialization of those who have fallen asleep. Did you hear that? That's so uh, again, I'll repeat because I have my back to you guys. The three Saturday of souls, again, I put them in quotes, Saturday of souls that we celebrate and the Orthodox Church for this Saturday, the following Saturday, and then the one after that, were put into place, three of them together, so that we can commemorate the tradition of praying for people during, um, during the importance of Saturday and realizing that that's the day of Saturday of Souls. So that's why the Ch Greek Orthodox Church here in the United States has those three Saturdays. But correctly, there's actually only two real Saturday of Souls defined. This Saturday, can anyone guess what the other one is? The weekend of Ayub Nebuchadnezzar. Ah, bravo, Irini. See, you knew it. So Irini knows the answer, but she also had the other traditional answer of the four, right? So both are correct. So we do it on this week, Meat Fair Saturday. Yeah. And then we also do the one on the Saturday before Holy Pentecost. Those are the two days known as Saturday of Souls. The following one, is uh, let me look at chapel. Maybe they might have something nice here. Because um, I want to show it to you so we can get a better understanding. Can you guys see on the right? Right here. Can you guys see to the right or no? No. Yes. yes. See the calendar. Okay, good. You see the calendar. Okay. So this see Saturday of Souls. Today's the twenty third, and now we're going to go to the following week, March. March 5th, and it's called Cheese Fair Saturday. Did you notice that? It's not called uh, Saturday of Souls. And this one we commemorate. Oh. This one on Cheese Fair Saturday, we commemorate the God-bearing fathers after preparing us through the preceding feast for the stadium, the Stadio of Spiritual Struggles. Now set before us the men and women who have passed their lives in a manner pleasing to God, so by their example they may make us more eager in the work of virtue and more courageous against the passions. And as experienced generals, when they prepare their soldiers for battle, urge their soldiers on by recalling for them the heroic exploits of excellent men. So the soldiers take courage and charge wholeheartedly against the enemy. Okay, that's an example. But it says, so that the, but even so, the God-bearing fathers do for our sakes now by appointing this day is a common memorial and feast of all those saints who by many labors overcame the passions and became well, oh, well pleasing to God. So that we too, looking to the life of the righteous, might imitate them as far as possible and contending the courageously against the passions of the cops of virtues. Now, the God-bearing fathers is the Greek term for osi. So like St. Anthony the Great the desert fathers and the desert mothers who were in strict asceticism, who fought the attitude to be in this because they, as I said earlier, how do we take the themes of Lent and the Triodion and, and apply them to our day-to-day -day lives? 
the saints did that for every theme that exists through the Triodon and Great Lent, and then naturally participate that every day of their life. So what were the, what are the general themes? Now them, we're honoring them on this cheese fair Saturday, but the general themes, as we know, is the publican and the Pharisee. One is boastfulness, the other one's humility. This past Sunday with the prodigal son, it's about forgiveness and repentance. This upcoming Sunday, which is the judgment Sunday, meat fair Sunday, what does it talk about? Which I said before, it is my favorite scripture reading because that is how you will be judged. Very black and white. And we're going to go into it, okay? And I like that one. So that's one of my favorite. We'll go into it in more depth. And then the fourth one is the cheese fair Sunday one, which is kind of the reality of our fallen state as a humanity. I'll go back to the calendar for forgiveness Sunday. So forgiveness Sunday, we remember the the exile from paradise of Adam and Eve, which then in turn, they also then witness their fast and their separation from the bounty and the grace of God, right? Because of their transgressions of not obeying his law and commandments. So then in turn, it's all symbolic because in why? Christ, after his baptism, went into the desert for 40 days. Moses as well too. The Jews and the Israelites in their manner as well too. And then many church fathers and many people who are devout into following into our, our Lord and to his studies understand that this is our now doorway into coming into that fasting period. Because in fasting, we talk about this every year, it is the, it is the necessary tool to cleanse, to cleanse us of the ills that our body has, spiritually, mentally, and possibly physically, whether that means eating too much lentils or <laughs> fasolava or whatever it might be. It definitely does a nice uh, rotation and gives us a good uh, clean bill of health after the first week. I can promise you that one. Um, but also has a lot of fiber, as they say. But truthfully, truthfully about Lent, as we understand and we see now, it's really about the understanding. Because if you ever hear me when I talk about confession and repentance and forgiveness, it's a necessary tool to relieve us of the gunk of sin upon us. So fasting has that mutual benefit as well, too. It's not that one is greater than the other, but they actually need to be done simultaneously. So that we encourage people to fast. Then we encourage people to also go to confession. So that once they've cleansed themselves now out of any spiritual um, chains that have held them down, or then any physical and mental ones that obviously can be from the benefit of fasting in the food manner, then in turn with a fasting from sin manner, we are uniting ourselves closer with Christ. That's the whole purpose of this. That's the whole reason. It's not to torture anyone. It's not to make everyone suffer and say, woe is me. I mean, I've, I've brought this up in conversations, but think about this. For the 40-day period, when you talk about it in general, immediately the mindset is, wow, that's a long time. A long time. I know people that are doing daily cleanses for like seven days straight where they didn't do anything. No eating, no drinking. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's intense. Here, all the church is encouraging you is refrain from the gluttony of life. Uh, pray more. Um, give alms. And then in turn, ask for, uh, ask for repentance and offer forgiveness to those who have done you wrong. That's, and the best part is everything I just said is that's the Christian life. And that's supposed to happen every day. But that's what Great Lent does for us. It's that reminder. It's that refresh. It's that engine light in your lives. You know, it's on. Hey, hey. Ours is worse. Ours, instead of it being orange, it's red. Oh, I got so much gunk. Help me. Clean me. Let's do what we need to do to become better Christians. And that is why Lent is such an important aspect. And naturally, as I brought up with other fasting periods of the church, can anyone tell me what the other three fasting periods are of the church? I know one is the Beca Padab Gusto, and one is Christmas. Excellent. And one is Christmas time. Yeah, we have the Christmas one, which is the Advent Fest. And what's the fourth one? Is there an Apostle one? Saints, Peter, and Paul. <laughs> Correct. So it's the Apostles one. And that one varies. <laughs> it all depends on when, when um, Pentecost falls. And then it starts after the Sunday of All Saints. So, for instance, last year, I think there was actually no fast. I think it was All Saints. <coughs> I think Monday was Vespers for Saints Peter and Paul. 
and then Tuesday was St. Peter and Paul. <coughs> Excuse me. The fast for St. Peter and Paul actually concludes it, and it's not actually for the whole apostles, but we call it the apostles' fast, because then after Peter and Paul, we celebrate the Synaxis, the con celebration of the whole 12 holy apostles of our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ. So those are the four fasting periods. But we talked about that. But let's go back to the third Saturday of uh, of Sijo Sabado and see what we actually really celebrate. Because this is when many people celebrate their names day, the first Saturday of Lent, right? Proto Sabato Tisnistias. And that is the commemoration of the miracle of the Koliva brought, brought by St. Theodore of the Tiro. Now, we just celebrated St. Theodore this past, I don't know, a week ago on February 17th. But in this one, we actually honor and commemorate the miracle of the Koliva. Koliva is the bowl of boiled wheat. That's all it symbolizes. And what we understand about the boiled wheat is that it's commemoration of the struggle. Think of it as a manner of like when the Israelites were in the desert and they had no sustenance and they received the manna from heaven. Remember, they received that sustenance to continue. They got strength and they got from there. In this story that we also hear, now this dates back to around 300, 400 AD. In Constantinople, there was a great famine. And then on top of it, the idolaters of that time were in such an attitude to mock and ridicule the, the Christians during Lent that what did they do? They knew that during Lent they would refrain from the meats. So they would purposely spoil any foods that they would normally during Great Lent, you know, simple lentil foods. And they would say, eat of the dirtiness of the pigs and all this stuff, or you're going to die of starvation. Think of that torture. And that wasn't just for one saint. That was for thousands of Christians. And they put that there. So St. Theodore, as we hear about the story, we then witness is that the saint revealed himself to the bishop of that time, Evoxios of Constantinople. And he then told them to be careful together immediately on Monday morning and prevent them from purchasing those food, foods, but rather to make koliva, the boiled wheat, to supply their needs, to give them sustenance. The bishop asked what koliva might be, and the saint answered, koliva is what we call boiled wheat and efchaita, uh, I would almost say. Thus, the purpose of the apostate, apostate was brought to naught, and the pious people were preserved undefiled for the whole of clean week, which is Kathara Evdomada, which is the Saturday of the first week of Great Lent. And this is rendered thanks to the martyr on the Saturday and celebrated with a commemoration with Koliva. It says, wherefore, the church keeps this commemoration each year to the glory of God and the honor of the martyr. So that's why then in turn, we also make Koliva because it's placed on that Saturday. It's placed to show the significance of the resurrection of our Lord, as he also talked about the wheat and about the seed and how it symbolizes that when it dies and withers, for a foretelling of his own death, that when it resurrects, when it grows again and blossoms, it will bear much fruit to those that actually sustain and maintain it. There is the whole symbolism. That's why we have koliva. That's why we make the boiled wheat. That's why, but then I've noticed different traditions. I know Russians, I know Serbians, Romanians, Bulgarians. They have a different type. I remember being at a Romanian monastery. They had like a pudding. It was like a rice or wheat pudding. So if ours is boiled, it actually is like a legit pudding, but it's decorative. We'll have a cross on it. They'll put a candle, but it's like a pudding. And I remember that mm -hmm. as a kid, because I'm like, this isn't koliva, but it, it tastes good. Okay, I'll t I can handle this. Not too bad. So each um, each uh, culture and ethnicity adjusts it or changes it to their needs and wants. Okay, so that's the three Saturdays. But now we understand that it's the first Saturday called the Psycho Sabato. And the other two Saturdays, we just add memorial services to the end of the service so that we can commemorate those who have fallen asleep, whoever they might be. But the first Saturday, um, the Meat Fair Saturday, which is Psycho Sabato, and then the second one, which is on the Saturday of the Holy Spirit, of, um, of Holy Pentecost, that is actually it's, it's prescribed to be to commemorate all of those righteous who have witnessed. It even here is patriarchs, bishops, emperors, kings, queens, uh, monastics, laity, clergy, everyone. It's the whole ikumeni. Ikumeni means the whole world. It means the whole people. All those who are followers of Christ, 
all those who we remember and all those who we do not remember. As I said before, there are many people who are righteous, who were probably into the eyes of God saintly, that we might not know, recognize, or commemorate. And so that's kind of like the all-encompassing aspect. Can anyone get, tell me another time in which we are also going into an all-encompassing effort of prayer for the living and the dead? Does anyone know where or when I do that? An all-encompassing prayer for living and for the dead. Think. What do you think? What do you think Father Chris does it? You you gotta you, I can't use the words because it, it gives it away. It you gotta think. I'm, try I'm guessing a yon pandon, but it's just a guess. Okay. So a yon pandon naturally is prayer for we commemorate all the saints, right? It's all saints day, but we commemorate anyone who is a saint, both known and unknown. But what I was referring to is when do I, naturally as a priest, commemorate all the living and all the dead, as well as names submitted to me? Eucharist? Yes, the pan. Oh. So the pan, because the pan being that it's circular, universal, mm -hmm. has no end, uh, all names that are placed in there are not only prayed for, but even the prayers leading up of the preparation, the oblation, it is the fine of all those righteous, and it even breaks it down to, again, kings, queens, emperors, uh, faithful women, men, martyrs, children, whoever the case may be. And that's including to all those that I commemorate, you know, with the names, you know, people give me names of us, and whoever the case may be. So the Eucharist, which then signifies to us that we are always praying for the living and the dead, and then how they're put to the, uh, in front of the presence of the, um, no, the body of, of God, the Lamb of God, that then in turn is a portion for us. Uh, that we know that is broken up for the forgiveness of our sins and for life eternal. Okay, so now Judgment Sunday. I don't like this one. What happened to the Go Arch? I'll figure it out. Uh, go Arch Lent. Maybe that was it. Because uh, it had a really good breakdown. I also had the icon. Here we go. Sorry, friends. Any questions so far with Riodion or beginning of Lent? Speak now, forever hold your peace. No. Okay. How come uh, the Sunday of Zacharias is sometimes in the period and sometimes not? Uh, very, very good question. That's just depending on the uh, cycle of the gospel readings. It's not prescribed that it has to be read, uh, but it's also to the to the intricacy of Luke's gospels. Because if you actually notice Luke's gospel in the fall. Um, when it kind of kickstarts before um, Christmas, it it, uh, it kind of like hops around. It'll go in like sequential order, then all of a sudden it'll go to like Luke 10, goes back to like Luke 7. So it's not actually in order. Where Matthew is kind of in order, John is kind of in order, right? And then Mark, Mark's kind of inserted throughout uh, the, the year into different parts. And we're actually going to read some of Mark's Gospels in the... Um, in the uh, during the Great Lent uh, Great Lent Sundays and Saturdays, but let me let me see if I get a better detail uh, about the uh, why was it was the Zacchaeus one. Okay. Oh. I don't think anyone's actually put a study to it. There's a, I'm trying to think how I could show it to you online. I don't have some of my stuff to. If it was, yeah, it was the 15th week. I think the last gospel, so the Russians read it. We didn't. It's all about how they, they put the canonion and the prayer of the worship and the, the determination of what gospels will be read beforehand. Mm. I don't know. I don't know if I can give you a, a, an answer that can define it more clearly. No, this is about Zacchaeus. We all know. And I love the story 
I mean, the story really is about redemption. And naturally, it's funny how our, how our Lord, how they even put the details that he was really short in stature. Mm -hmm. you, know what I remember, you know what I think of Zacchaeus? I think of him like Danny DeVito. <laughs> I, I know it's kind of, kind of funny, but that's how I would think of Zacchaeus. Because he's all short and stocky. And any movie or show that, like, you know, remember, like a taxi was with, like that rough guy. And you would expect money or whatever. That's how I saw Zacchaeus. Mm -hmm. And then when he's able to somehow climb a tree and then to see Christ and Christ points him out. Um, I think it's really uh, beneficial. Yeah, see. I don't, I don't have a good definition for it. Yeah, I'm sorry, Greg. I, I know there's a better definition for it. When I can give the reason, I will... I'll send you the link so we could so we could see it together. But I, I there is a reason why it just it wasn't prescribed in the deal in the in the uh, sequential order of how they combine the uh, gospels, leading in to um. Oh, you know what it is? Hold on. See, my brain works sometimes. <laughs> Epiphany fell on a Thursday. So Today's the tw yes, 20th was. So that means. So just you run out of Sundays. Yeah, I'm looking at the Sundays because then I'm looking at Christmas was a Saturday. Sunday was the Sunday after Christmas. And then. And then you have the second, which was the Sunday before Epiphany. Then you have the Sunday after Epiphany, the 9th, 16, 23, 30. Yeah, I think they ran out of one Sunday before the Triodion began. So if there was another, yeah. So if there was an addition, if the Triodion either started later or if Christmas fell like on a Sunday and then it, then it didn't have to take that other Sunday, then you could have put in Zacchaeus' gospel. Mm. But there was five Sundays in January. I don't know. 16, 23, 30. Publican. Why wasn't the 6th or the 30th? I don't know. I can look more into it. But it might, I, think, I think that's one of the reasons as well, too. Good question. Very good question. All right. So, uh, Judgment Sunday. Okay. Uh, meat Fair. It's the last day that we can eat meat and be merry and remind ourselves that there's a reality in life. And that's called Judgment. So you've heard me even in our recent studies for Bible study that one of my biggest complaints that I'm realizing as an Orthodox Christian, let alone as a clergyman, is that many of us are not thinking about what is to come uh, in our lives. And when I say what is to come, I'm not thinking about our five, 10 year plan of life. I'm talking about the reality that at some point we all close our eyes, because if we put that into a realization, we then realize that there is uh, an importance to what I do on a day to day basis. Um, and that if I, because it should always then turn to an avenue of self-reflection, um, repentance, forgiveness, and then changing one's life. Sadly, sadly enough, people are not recognizing that and nor do we see a reality to even this Sunday. So even though throughout scripture, especially in the new Testament, we hear about the understanding of judgment, uh, the the gospel that we read for funeral services <clears throat> talks about how God allows Christ to be the one to give the judgment to humanity because he is known as the son of man, right? On the post, right? And then in turn, he then defines how people will be judged. To those who have done good, to a, a resurrection of life, and to those who have done evil, to a resurrection of judgment. You see, judgment, when it's given, is harsh. It's not always put in a nice positive spin. Yet here, we're witnessing on the last judgment that our Lord will obviously preside over it. in his glory, right, with the apostles and the 12 thrones. We kind of see this then defined in the understanding of um, the second coming of our Lord. We see it in the essence of um, the book of Revelations that St. John the Theologian wrote and everything else. But here you kind of see a very vivid description of parousia, which is really the second coming of our Lord, Christ in all his glory, the Theotokos to his right, St. John to the left, just like the imagery of the iconography, 
Then we witness on the icon screen. Christ is first. To his right is the Virgin holding Christ's child. To him, to his left, is St. John. And then how we honor would be our patron saint. And that's the icon screen. Recognizing that's the heavenly kingdom, the holy altar. Okay. Here you see the angels and archangels, the, the very forms. Here you got the preeminent of the apostles, Peter and Paul. And then here you have a wording that's in Greek that I'll try to translate. Right here is the altar, the holy altar, where you see the crucifix of our Lord with the spear and the sponge, and it's empty. And then the gospel being the word of God. And then these two, can anyone guess what these probably two are that are at the footstool of the holy altar? Who do you think? It, it says Adam and Eve. I read it. Yeah, but I <laughs> Good. So good. Okay, good. So someone's paying attention to read. So this is Adam and this is Eva, right? Adam and Eve, and they are the representation always of humanity, being at, that, at the presence of repentance and thankfulness to our Lord's just redemption and mercy and compassion, for then he raised them from, have, from hell, right? And so then in turn, this is where it is represented here. And then you got the, the scales, right? And you see these little um, scrolls. The scrolls are of the people's lives, okay? And this is the Archangel Michael, naturally seen with the sword as the defender. And then here are those who have fallen asleep in the tombs, and those who are alive go after the ones who are the tombs first. The great horn, right, that is bellowed out by the angel, and that's also symbolic from what St. Paul said from the Thessalonians, right? Um, that's also from the funeral service, that as the, as the shout of command the archangel's trumpet and everything else. Our Lord will come in his redemption. All right, I'm saying his glory. And then to from here. Here, you see the uh, guardian angel as the one taking us to heaven, understanding that he's been our protector. And then sadly, the state that, and, it's, and now you can see all this. It's all symbolic to, to witness, to show that all those who have not followed in Christ and now live the life of Christ, then get dragged into the fiery furnace of hell, actually with the demons and the representations of hell. Okay, so now that's now that's the judgment. I'm going to show you. So here, I got to see. I think I think that's from the gospel reading, talking about bless the the blessed of his uh, of his fathers who will receive their just, and then we'll go into that discussion. I want to show you a couple more icons of the Last Judgment, just so we can go into more detail. Okay. So this one is a very popular, this one. Mm. Oh. Okay, can everyone see it pretty clearly? Yes. Yeah. All right, so here, all right, you see Christ in his glory with the universes, everything that he's created, the heavens and the earth, okay? Um, you see the angels right here are the, the, the apostles who are judging the 12 tribes because they are representative of each tribe. The Virgin, St. John, and then here are the angels proclaiming to those who have done good to the resurrection of life and to those who have done evil to a resurrection of judgment. And this is, the for, this is the formation of that judgment. And you can see it being that this is that river of fire. So they say the great demon, the pain, the agony. And this all here represents creation, right? So that they hear the exclamation. You see the symbolism of the animals, okay? In all different forms. Here are the graves, those who have fallen asleep, awaiting the resurrection of life. And then here, right, is that doorway. And who's in front? You know, we said Peter with the keys, right? Because he said that he would be the one. This is the six-winged seraphim that guards the doorway and separates, um, you know, those who were to enter into uh, to heaven. Now, naturally, that this is also represented sometimes with Adam and Eve, 
when they were ex expelled from, from Eden, right, from heaven with God. And then here, who do we got? Who can tell me? He is a cosmos. Mm, no. Who is the father of many, many nations? Abraham. Yeah, good job. That's what he's representing. See it? Because when we say, if you notice what I say at funeral service, I say to place their soul in the bosom of Abraham. The bosom of Abraham. Mm -hmm. Who's this? Who carried a cross? No, that's not a good, that's not a great, great answer. <laughs> that's not a correct statement. Who, who had some, who had some involvement with the cross? Oh, a cross. One the, Simon. One no, 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 Greg, say it. You're going to say it. One of the thieves? Yeah, the thief who repented on the cross. Because he, remember what our Lord said? You will be with me in heaven. Okay. And then here the virgin, naturally, as she brings life into the world. And then this is kind of similar to like the platitera, because you have the two angels to her left and right, representing how she is more spacious than the heavens. Okay. So that's a really good example here. The orders of the saints, all the various ones, all the variety. Not just one type, not one example, all the different ones. Okay, so we've got that. Now let's go into the understanding of this Sunday. Because in this Sunday, we hear the gospel from Matthew 25, 31, 46, where Christ speaks about what will happen at this specific point in time when he will come in his glory and all the holy angels with him. And that says, at his coming, he will sit on the throne of his glory and all the nations will be gathered before him. He will separate them as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats, right? The sheep will be placed to his right hand and the goats to his left. To the sheep, he will say, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That is what was said over here in Greek. Okay, when I showed you up here, yeah, this is what was prepared for the, for, for the beginning of salvation. That's what these two scrolls say in Greek, okay? To the to the. This kingdom is offered to the sheep because of their compassion and service to those in need. Uh, for Jesus says, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Now, I don't hear from Christ saying, oh, you gave this amount of money on this day. You help someone on this Saturday of this year. He made it very bland and very poignant to understand when and how we are supposed to live as Christians. Now, if I could find this icon, I will be very happy. Um, oh. Come on, Father Chris. Oh boy, can I make it bigger? I can, but I hope it works. No, sorry, I got like you guys on one end. Sorry, friends, hold on. It's gonna be an easier. Way. I don't know how to. I don't know how to do. Does anyone know how to zoom on a on a key, on a keyboard? Control and scroll that. Control. This. Yeah, bravo. Good job. See, we have tech all over. Oh, but now it's two scroll. All right. Here. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me. When I was sick, you served me, you ministered to me. And when I was in prison, you visited me. And who's the representative? Christ. That's a, pair, that's a very powerful image. Do you notice that it's not you doing all six? It's someone different each time representing how all of us are called to do it. So the question is, why don't we do that? And then he then says, the she okay, I said to the, 
And then this is the sheep who are the righteous chosen for the kingdom who will ask how this could be so. They will ask Jesus when he was hungry or thirsty, stranger, naked, and in prison. He will answer them being set by saying, Assuredly, I say to you, and as much as you did to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Oh, this just says the resurrection of the dead. Okay. Christ King sitting on the throne of his judgment will then turn to the goats on his left and say, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Right? Okay. Right? Right? Left. Okay. We got it. He will condemn them because they did not feed him when he was hungry, and they did not participate in everything. The goats will ask the Lord, when did we see you, Lord? And it says, we will say to them, assuredly, I say to you. Did you know this, even the terminology of assert, assuredly? Mm, where's my go arch? I wonder what they use for Greek. I don't know if he used that mean lego I mean. I want to look at the gospel for Sunday. Sorry. That's very important. If you notice when our Lord says, uh, I mean lego I mean, I mean is a final statement that there is nothing to think about other than that command or exclamation from Christ. You know, truly I say to you, assuredly I say to you. Let me see what he used for assuredly in Greek. Hold on one sec. Click. That would be the modern term. What to say, you man? Yeah, it's a mean lego I mean. I was right. So I guess it could be a surely or certainly I say to you, a mean lego I mean. Again, that's that statement. That's very powerful. Whenever we hear in any of the, the scripture readings about understanding our Lord's exclamation to a point, he always says, I mean, lego I mean, uh, surely I say to you, or stating that so it be. And it's the same thing. Then when he tells people stories. Did you ever notice when he tells people stories or parables, what does he usually finish with? What sentence is usually finished with? He said the story, and then he leaves with like a, a sentence. How it's composed in the, uh, especially in the scriptures, how we read it. He says one sentence. I've, I've noticed those who have ears, let them hear. Uh, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Bravo, right? Because then, are they going to hear and listen? Or they just like, you know, like our parents would say, benaki ke benaki, right? Enters one ear, exits out of the other ear. But that's sadly what happens many times in our lives. So very good. Yes. So then again, he concludes his words. It says, so the last judgment by saying those on the left will go away into the everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So again, it kind of encompasses what I was trying to bring up regarding with our theme. And that that's what Great Lent does for us is the essence that we in our lives have the great duty and challenge to do is to live our lives knowing what is to come coming forward, going forward. And it just perplexes me as a, as a Christian and as a clergyman, how very few contemplate the reality of life. Because if we actually lived a life understanding the, the little time and the unknown ahead of us, would we not, shouldn't we want to live it the most Christ-like as possible? Uh, it's, to me, it's very perplexing. Because, and I'm going to stop to share, I'm going to stop to share there, because now it's just more of a discussion point, because I want to hear from your point of views. But um, it's, very, it's very conflicting when we state we're Christians, right? We state it. I attend a Christian church. I, I believe in Christ. I say the creed. I do whatever I do and everything else. I give or however it is. But when we look at the big picture, when our Lord is going to see us, or talk to us, what do you think he's going to say to you? Or how is he supposed to speak to you? Has anyone ever read um, or seen any snippets from Radio Babylon? Sometimes it's a podcast, but they have some really cool snippets. Uh, I'd like to show a couple if I can find them. Uh, wait one sec. Babylon. Oh, God, Babylon. Oh, it's Coffee with Jesus, Radio Free Babylon. Um, you're going to say, what does this mean? It's not, it's, it's not mocking him. 
Yes. So a lot of these are like pastoral questions. Uh, here, okay, I'll use this one. I'll screen share real quick. Just so you guys can get an understanding where I'm coming from. Because this is the world that our people try to live in, okay? Let's use this one. Let's see what's going to pop up. I apologize. Okay. All right, here. Okay, here's one for uh, a priest. This is kind of funny. Uh, it says, I need help with the sermon I'm preparing for the Sunday, Jesus. Okay. He says, well, let's start with the title, Joe. When things don't go your way, how not to be a giant baby and throw a tantrum over it. It is a little much. And there it says, it's working. It's a working title, Jesus. And then he says, good. Work a little hard on Joe, because this should be a time for healing, not for salting the wound. Okay. Now, the whole point of this, of these like um, kind of conversations is they're very, they're supposed to hit at home. And for us to really think about um, how we're supposed to live our lives. Now, look at this one. It has a theme. Imagine. Here, a gentleman having coffee says, imagine, son of man, that there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us, only sky. Now, remember, that's from uh, the lyrics of, uh, of John Lennon. Okay. Sorry. It says, you can imagine all day long, Satan, it won't, it won't change anything. It says, imagine there's no countries, right? There's nothing to kill for, no religion. Imagine all the people living life in peace, boy, king. Funny how you start this by imagining there's no heaven, scene, And in the text breath, you're actually describing heaven, right? And so, again, it's trying to show to the attitudes of what we're supposed to be and how to live it. Here's another one where it says, rejoice and be glad. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And then he responds, awesome, man. And then here, and if a situation arises that should cause me to temporarily lose that focus, Jesus, I will rejoice and be glad in that too. Even awesomer, And It's kind of comical, but it's a, re it's a relatable attitude because how do we live our lives is we state the one part about Christ and God, yet even when something arises, I don't know many people, when they lose focus, continue to say i will rejoice and be glad in that too now, i know there's, there's some satire there is some comedy with it but there are there's some decent ones um that we need to understand and so i i usually like looking at some of these and uh it's just for a change of thought it's not to be you know satire or to make fun of or whatever but just more of food for thought when we really contemplate these attitudes because none of us are having coffee with god we're not sitting there talking with him and trying to understand him because if someone wanted to, realistically, all you have to do is open your book, open your scriptures and study and put that word to your heart and to your mind and to your soul. The problem is we don't have it ingrained in us. If we had it ingrained in us, we would understand our faith much more strongly, much more devoutly, and we will live it on a day-to-day -day basis. But there's a big struggle. It's a big struggle. We're in a world, we're in a modern day persecution. We have to understand it acknowledge it and believe it and that modern day persecution is the decimation of the family unit and a separation from the need that we need god or that god exists because in turn if we see that around us it's evident in everything that we do throughout our day-to-day -day lives people i know people I, I sometimes chuckle when i hear people still complain about why god's not in schools that's that's 30 years old plus when I was in school, when I was in school, even in, in elementary school, that's when the beginnings of like the, uh, the, the grumbling about the uh, pledge of allegiance. Why is that in there? It says an under God indivisible with Liberty. And it was a justice for all. I never forgot what it is. What? It wasn't there till the 1950s. So they added 1950s, but now they bring it up regarding the complaint and it still continues and goes from there, but they bring up that struggle and so they removed God from, from, uh, from schools. But now what we're witnessing is we're seeing God removed from our everyday lives. Uh, you watch TV. There is no mention about God or faith. And if it is predominantly, if it's in a comedy, it's always in a satire manner. Did you notice like even those scripts that I showed you, those comic strips or whatever, that was a, a convoluted way for people to connect God into a modern world. But did you notice you had to be sarcastic or you had to be down to a human level because that's how we understand things in the poor state that we are, where even though we're given parables and teachings, 
some of us don't relate to it or we use it as mythology. It's uh, that was what someone said. Who knows if it's even real or if it's even tangible? And then in our continued understanding about our faith and with God, it's now being removed from the family unit, and it's also separated the family unit because of how busy our lives are. Again, I had a conversation earlier today about what we just went through. Yes, we're still in the midst of a pandemic. Yes, we see some attitudes of alleviating and opening up, but we had first world problems of a pandemic. There's war breaking out. There's people dying. Africa, other countries, and minimal are still suffering with starvation. Yet where they're suffering, there's more closeness with God. With us, with our pride and our egos and wealth, we are separating ourselves from God. I talked about this with Ben a few days ago in a conversation. Tower Babel, Babylon, the, the royal ship of, of Jerusalem, you name it. Whenever we build ourselves up as a civilization, as a society, is when we tend to crumble. Because why? We don't have God. In truth, if you actually look at Christianity, modern Christianity, where it came from, even with the expansion of the Byzantine Empire, once Justinian and all these other emperors were creating both, you know, Hagia Sophia and everything else, once pride and ego kept coming to be built, be put in, or, or the great demise of Christianity was when the emperors and kings were then making influences into the theology and the canons and the rubrics of the church is when you started seeing the fractures of the faith and then the beginning of the divisions of Orthodoxy, Catholicism, Catholicism, Protestant, et cetera, et cetera. Because why? Pride, ego, control, power, envy, and jealousy have reigned supreme. And it's a constant, it's a constant wave. It's a constant roller coaster of civilization of life. And we're in that currently right now. I mean, look at us now. Um, we have thousands of denominations of Christianity. And if you talk to any Christian, pastor, clergyman, their whole goal is to make sure they get people in the church, right? We need people in church. I need people in church. Okay, great, great. So when I just have a conversation with a family tonight I was with, and they're kind of telling me, they're like, you know, uh, they have a struggle too with their children, but they try to understand it is, what, how, how do you get edified from worship? When, when you come to worship, it's like you were in a, a roller coaster or a movie. You know, so movies are a type of roller coasters. There's emotions, there's action, there's movement, there's ups and downs, right? Low, high points, whatever. And that's how people feel when they come into a worship. If they are not a part of it and actively engaged in it, you could just feel like you have a, a blinders on and there's a screen in front of you. You're watching this whole soiree. You, you sit down after an hour and a half, half hour, maybe if you're there long enough, two hours, and you're like, wow, what was that? Or, wow, that was pretty interesting. Or, I feel really blessed. I feel really edified. But that's to the person and how they also participate in the worship of the service. Yes. Can we always go into additional discussions regarding language and everything? Of course. But that's not, the, that's not for here or there at this moment. But the reality is there is not a true understanding of our communal and symbiotic relationship with God. And when we talk about God, we're understanding that in the three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's that's a very, very difficult state because then the devil, where I brought it up this past Sunday, regarding his, um, his strength in which he has now put the shame on forgiveness than repentance, that in turn separates me from God even more so. So if I'm separated from God, how can I even contemplate a type of judgment? That's why people really don't care. Does anyone does anyone have any words on this topic, especially about the judgment? I, I mean, what what bias what bias statement exists is that, and with respect to my elderly, to my elders and loved ones who I know, and yourselves will too, judgment might be more relatable at an older age than it is at a younger age. It's relatable, whether that means mortality or reality, different story. But it seems somewhat a little bit more closer to my age group. I think that that doesn't have to do with the age group so much as how we taught them. Because mm. judgment was very close to me when I was a kid, too. I, to oh. honest, I had a grandmother with a really heavy ceramic uh, mm. 
handle on her cane. And <laughs> she was, <laughs> it was just like wide earth with it. Yeah. You, know, you step out of line and you got it upside the head. Watch out. It, so, you know, the idea of, but today it's a, a lot of, you know, you have a lot of people, well, you can't judge people. Mm. Uh, we're not supposed to be judgmental, but you, you're, when they're clearly doing things wrong, you can't judge the action either, right? Um, you know, we have, uh, tried to make things so comfortable, I think, over time for, for young folks. They're not understanding the value of striving. They're not understanding the value of suffering through something or pushing forward or anything else. And mm -hmm. I think back to even stupid things like uh, my, my kids were pretty high level swimmers and there were certain meets we would go to where everybody got a trophy, mm -hmm. you know. Participation award. And yep, pretty soon. Great job. Like, I'm not going to that meet. Doesn't mean anything. Mm. <laughs> so, but uh, that's a great example. Those yeah. are very good. So I, I do think that part of it is because we we've, we've excused our kids. We make excuses for our kids. You know, we're we're a little too um, a little too forgiving when they do things. Not that we want to. Do you? And then Jim, I want to hear from you, and then anyone else online too. I maybe. Maybe the problem is that they are using the word judge. Mm -hmm. So if it's talking about someone's lifestyle or anything else, if we always highlight, so it's the example of us then being a bigot, a racist, any of that stuff, if you talk about something in that manner. So then why don't we relate to that to a life of sin? Right. Because that should be judged. Right. And it's not. It's actually quite ignored. And that everything else I do, whether it's gambling, Stealing, adultery, you name it, top to bottom. It's okay. That's a part of life. But when we highlight those avenues, is when that's when you're defined as judgmental or judge. Because then the problem, well, then think about think about the people who have addictions in avenues of uh, lust, uh, greed, gambling, drugs, and everything else, where if you actually call them out, what is it called? It's called an intervention. Mm -hmm. Right? It's not judging. No. It's an intervention. I'm saving you. Again, now you're going to either apples to oranges or to the weight of the scale, mm -hmm. probably determining it. Also, to what you said before, too, also to the um, the theme of the of the period. Oh, we're now all into social justice, or now we're into equality. And I said, <laughs> go back to Christ. That's that was already de that was already de defined. Right. We're the ones who manipulated it or now have com convoluted to 2000 years later where we are defining social justice or we are defining equal rights to this modern day i still don't find it equal and that's equal rights on on legality like you can vote but then you know there's separation why are there class systems if we're technically equal then we should all be able to have the best amount now that also gives you the opportunity for national you know, money, capitalism, stuff like that, where anyone has that opportunity. But then there's always to find some have better opportunities than others, whether they want to define it by race or color or whatever the case would be, fine. But it goes back to the, the crucial part because all of these attitudes I just described have nothing to do with God. That's man-made definitions of equality. Those are all man-made definitions of justice. Is that... Appropriate. Jim, what do you think on any of these topics? I've seen hundreds and thousands of people who got judged. And generally, they don't care. The only thing that troubles them is that they got caught. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, they, they place themselves and give themselves priority over others and they don't worry about other people's rights and how others are treated. I love I, that's actually I really think, good. So Would you define that as more so? So then, to the now looking at them, is that an attitude of pride or greed? Because it's, it's basically greed. It, it, you know, pride with uh, getting away with it whenever you can. And that's but it's uh, it's the idea that I matter and you don't. Excellent. And, and they, right. And I they think that's that way until uh, at some point they either they are growing or they die. I, I, well, that's kind of, well, that, but then, okay, so then if I'm understanding you, you can also say that as like, you know, a, 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 a felon, someone who does yeah. some sort of, that's also, you can also relate it to a sinner. I mean, until a sinner, 
figures out or realizes that he's come. It's not that they don't realize that they're committing the sin. They have not gotten caught. They've not gotten in trouble. There's been no adverse effect for their action that they committed for that sin. Well, and then there's been no judgment rendered. Well, one of the, yeah, well, one of the things today, I mean, we, we're talking about where the devil enters in. I mean, the brilliance there for him is that he doesn't, you know, he doesn't need to get you to worship him. He just needs to get you to believe that what's right is wrong. Or, or that wrong and right. And, and so, God is not existent. So we start looking at things that are clearly wrong and deciding, no, well, that's just, it's maybe it's right for you, but not for me. And you know, how can I, you know, there's, there's no moral certainty. There's no, there's, there's, but there is, right? There are absolutes. Mm -hmm. There's no moral absolutes. But so that's one of the things that when we started pushing that line of thinking that there are no moral absolutes, what's right? Or, or, or maybe not so many in these other areas. Mm -hmm. I think back to, I don't know if you remember this, but when, uh, um, Rudy Giuliani was the mayor of, of New York. It was like it, they they were having such a horrible crime spree and everything everything was going so badly. And he started off by making the police prosecute or catch and prosecute taggers with graffiti. So all of a sudden, now the small things are getting punished too. Within two years, they had turned it completely around. Mm -hmm. So as soon as we start letting the small things go, right? Mm -hmm. Then the bigger things come. It's always the, it's a little, you know, give an inch, they take a mile. And I, and to that statement, I don't disagree. And then I want to hear from a few people online before we conclude. But um, the one issue that I see is um, uh, if you want to have someone to the defense of that or the argument mm -hmm. on the other side, which then I get a little frustrated is if they kind of complain about the over incarceration or the amount of population incarcerated, that is also deterrence on our, no, that's actually more of a black eye on our civilization, not society, yeah. because there is actually no attempt of real possible reform in a general setting for those who actually go in into being incarcerated. Yeah, that, that was my complaint for years, and it falls on deaf ears, but you see it costs a lot of money. Yeah, exactly. So you said but it's not a general settle for temporary deterrence which really doesn't it's separate it you're right it's i put them in, i put them in a structure separated from society that has no effect to me right now where then you then get the parole settings and then you're saying okay are they going to come out or how are they going to be and whatever the case would be and you don't know and that where i feel is the injustice from us as a society and civilization where we know that's not a priority when you Got to cut funding at some point. So yeah, what do we do? Uh, well, yeah, we'll, we'll cut the educational program. Oh my yeah. gosh! Mm -hmm. They can't complain. They're not voting. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and right. Then, then you wonder, you know, why, why are we seeing the same people over same and over ones. again until they get either sold, they can't do things, anymore. or they do something as heinous that where it's life, or and they get killed. Yeah. It's, uh, anyone online uh, regarding what we're talking about with judgment or anything else, uh, please feel free just to kind of enhance the discussion. Anyone? Anyone have anything to say? This isn't a TV screen. We're live. <laughs> so, Father, I was just going to say that, you know, it's um, there's a couple other um, gospel lessons throughout the year that have always had an impact on me, especially uh, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Mm -hmm. and um the parable about the the great wedding banquet and mm -hmm. um i do remember one year um the message associated with that is that um, um there will come a time in everyone's life when the only thing that matters is your relationship to god and um that's always struck home with me and um um had an impact you know um I know that I'm still way short of where I need to be, but um, it's it stayed with me for many years. Mm. That's very that's very good. That's very powerful, you know, and understanding the reality of this. I mean, I, I wouldn't even talk about the representation of what Christ said, where he, you know, if you do it to the least of me, you, you do it to everyone. 
uh, Talisa, my brother, and you're doing unto me. But it's, uh, we didn't even go into that detail because that's, I, I, I know this sounds biased, but that's the easy stuff. Sir, minister, and stuff like that, that, sh that should be someone's lifeline. The problem is, you kind of said it before, Ben, and so, so did you, Jim, is we don't, um, we don't encourage a life with Christ in the family. I'll say that again. We don't encourage a life with Christ in our family. It, it, if the family has some sort of devotion or at least attachment with, with God, it clearly then becomes a priority encompassing the family. And what I was hinting before about understanding how do we relate these themes into our lives, it has to start with us, first of all, with the strengthening of the family unit as parents, as children, and everyone working together so that we can understand what it is to be a Christian, to be human being. As humans, we are communal creatures and that we were meant to be and to serve with others. The problem that we have now created in our civilization and modern day and whatever enhancements and te technological um, glories that we have achieved is that uh, it's all become the opposite where it's become uh, solo projects, where it's become competitive attitudes and everything. I mean, I have children, even my son, I, I have to reprimand often, my oldest, because he'll, he'll turn everything into a competition. I eat dinner first. Um, I got to the bathroom first. <laughs> I would pee first. I'm like, congratulations. Right. means nothing. And, I, and it's, very, it's bad because it, that is an ethos that is expressed even from the school system that he's part of, naturally, because they're just all like, you know, they're playing together. And then you see that in the world, right? I mean, what, do, what has anyone ever contemplated? And we're going to wrap this up, but um, the aspect of video games. What is usually everyone's goal in any type of video game that's very popular nowadays? Any video game. Your goal is to either be the best, be first, or achieve it the fastest, whatever it is, to finish it, to amass. Even me, I play a silly game, and I try to get as much as I can so I can beat the other ones. And then the best is after you've done it, how do you feel? You feel empty. Because why? It, you know, it's not like, it's not a video game where it says, you know, game over or conclusion. <laughs> you realize that life is still continuing. That's what happens to us. And now our world, on top of it, what we said with the separation from God, and the removal from the family, the family unit broken. Now we're going into a 2.0 scariness of reality where now we're inviting virtual reality into our minds. You know, you see this Oculus things that they put on your head. You have this whole stuff. And where you can be with people from all across the world in this virtual world in front of you while you're sitting at your home. So not on your computer anymore. Now it's actually something visible where you actually think you're a part of it. Oh, that's, that's just the first step. They're already developing their own chip. I mean, think about this. Think about this. that's where that's where I think the reality is now very scary because then that's our gen my generation and the generation of the couple that are gonna have to deal with it, and then not, and then we won't recognize what reality is or life is. So if we've already separated from God, how are we then going to turn re find who we are? We won't even know what hum humanity is. I mean, you've seen it as well in the schools and the colleges that they remove, or like you said, what funding do they cut the easiest first? liberal arts, sciences, and the humanities. Because why? What's the purpose of teaching those? Or, or philosophy and stuff like that. We know we're in the focus on. This is the breadwinner. Let's keep it on that. S sadly, and then the sad part is now, in the essence of what we had our conversation before too, it's infiltrating churches. Because churches are so cutthroat now, and with the lack of people that are participating in an engagement, where we're always worried about who's going to give what, who's going to be there, and and. Uh, how are we going to represent to other communities and people? And I, I get a, I get conflicted because um, those aren't metrics. So when people tell me, "Hey, Father, we had a really good Sunday. There was a lot of people at church." Okay, I had, I'll tell them, I had seven people on this Tuesday service, and I thought it was really nice because it was very beautiful. It was very solemn. They're going to look at you very perplexed. It doesn't matter. Just because there's bodies in there does not mean we are actively participating. And that's the frustration of us as an Orthodox Christian faith, where when we are participating in, co in conversations like we are now and participating in worship and studies and these things, that's, that's Christianity a lot because we're, we're keeping Christ to our focus. We're involving it in our families. 
we're taking these themes, just like Greg said, that strikes him. And I know these themes all strike all of us. And we're actually implementing them to our day-to-day -day lives. And we realize that it's going to be a struggle. We're going to realize that I comically laugh about every year, whenever I read one of these stories, about how it hits home to me one way or the other, more so than the year before. It does, it will, and it'll continue to the ages of ages. It doesn't matter. But that's why it shows to the, 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 the grace of the Holy Spirit being present in us, the grace of having Christ, the word, being able to be expressed, and then the worship that we have with our Lord to participate in that sacramental manner. That's why when we actually live about it and think about it, we then in turn will cultivate this. So when the time does come, whether we close our eyes, and remember, it can happen at any time. We don't know. And you would think that if we if you already know what's going to happen, why are we not changing that course in life that I'm in now? I struggle with it. Other ones as well, too. But that's what life does. And that's what we also allow us to do. Think, think about this last topic, and we're going to finish there. When you go home, or you're at home now, or wherever the case may be, you're going to turn on the TV, and some do, and you escape from reality. Did you ever hear that term? I remember that from, um, uh, I remember the, uh, the song from uh, Queen, Bohemian Rhapsody, it's like, escape from reality, <laughs> stuff like that. But that's a reality, because why we come home, and we don't want to talk about what we just went through the other day. I want to talk about what's going on here, and stuff like that. Okay, that's fine. You don't want to mesh everything else, that's good. But then we also then escape to a different reality, where we put on something that uh, makes us mindless, mindless, TV, uh, computers, uh, these are the biggest ones right here in front of me, right? I can do anything, mm -hmm. all that stuff. That's where we are escaping from reality because then in turn, sometimes we don't actually see the reality because what we'll realize is, man, that's a really bad reality. And then that's when we create virtual worlds or virtual feelings, virtual realities. Where then in turn, we focus that it's not, not a me. But going back to what we we're just trying to wrap up is what we said is, okay, when, when it hits you in the face, like you said, at some point, it does it to everyone. Mm -hmm. It will somehow always hit us in the face. Reality, whether that's through our sins, through our addictions, through our vices, through anything, whatever it may be, especially when we do it in, like, in a sneaky manner. We're just, I, I always paint the picture for us with God as little kids who have done something wrong. You don't want to get caught. You want to hide. And then after a while, some time passes, and you're like, okay, I'm kind of free. And then you continue. Got with it. And you got away with it. And you can continue your life. And you might do something again. And then it, that, that shame of the first sin has started to chill. And it chills more as you continue. And then it goes from there. And that's who we are as a fallen state of as a humanity. Even with Christ, redemption and retribution for us, we still then succumb to this. Where now, I said it, I don't know if I said it to you, I was talking to some people, but I'm hard pressed to believe that our Lord will actually be more merciful to us post his resurrection than to those that were before his resurrection. Because they didn't know. They didn't know what was the cup. They didn't know if there was a Messiah. They didn't know. And so in turn, when he saves us, stuff like that, we, again, I always use that term. You have the golden ticket. You have the key. So why, why don't we do it? Generations that have had such easy access to a Bible. Now we don't crack it up. No, now it's that, <laughs> it, now it's for show. You just kind of look at it. Oh, okay. And then if you open it to a general person right now, oh, it just looks too big. Yeah. And then and then it's so it's like you're already finding an excuse. Oh, well, maybe I read a little New Testament. Oh, oh gosh. Um, and then you get to they don't even contemplate the old testament. I mean, the old testament at this rate with most people will become obsolete. In generations to come, because they will not relate to it. it. It makes no, it'll make no sense to them. Even if we're building the bridges and everything else, that it was because of that to then know that we have been given these foundations. No, because then we won't even recognize Jesus, let alone recognizing that. So there's a lot to this world and to this attitude that we're living. But man, a lot of a uh, lot of fun discussion that we can always go into these avenues. So um, I hope tonight's discussion on understanding. Uh, this upcoming Sunday, the Judgment Sunday, the Triodion in general in Great Lent, uh, just kind of gives us self-reflection. That's all that's what these are. Uh, we, we need to self-reflect on where my life is. So when you hear these Sundays, when you go home, when you wake up in the morning, when you go to sleep at night, when you do your prayers and you offer them and you offer your glory to God, at the same time, offer the thought process of your self-reflection 
And in every instance, just like the publican does as we celebrate him, always finish with your attitude to our Lord to be merciful and ask him, Lord, have mercy on me, the sinner. We say it in the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner, right? And that's how we're taught it. And then naturally, uh, some Christians, we have the global skinny, which is the, uh, the prayer rope on our hands. And we pray and we do our cross. And then now we're going to come into Lent and everyone says, oh, I'm going to pray more. There's more services. I said, there's always services just come at any different time. Uh, but I hope it's a, I hope it is a springboard that we can somehow build ourselves closer with Christ. So once we get into Lent, it's just a, it's just a continuation. There's going to be struggle. There's going to be suffering. There's going to be joy. There's going to be blessings. And that's life. And so when it comes, it's not just routine, but it's a, it's that self-reflection time for us to figure out how to cleanse ourselves spiritually, psychologically, and physically, and uniting ourselves to Christ. So I pray all of you have a blessed, beautiful night. Uh, God willing, we'll see you uh, these upcoming services. And then following next week, we'll have again our Bible study next Wednesday. And then from there, we're going to go into the pre-sanctified liturgies, and we're going to have different talks and different discussions that are going to stray away. So next week, we're going to go into a Bible study. We're going to talk into our uh, Book of Romans, and then um, go into our discussions, and then we'll, we'll uh, reconvene again with our uh, Book of Romans after the, uh, the celebration of Pascha during a bright week in the following weeks that come. So that's it. God bless you all. Have a beautiful, peaceful night. My love to your family. Thank you, Father. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.